Good morning and welcome to hour five of Inclusive Design 24, uh, November 2017. Uh, ID 24 is brought to you by the Pasilo Group with kind support from uh, Barclays and the Centre for Inclusive Design. Uh, and you can find out more about both of those organisations on our website in the sponsors section. Very importantly, if you like this session uh, or ID24 at all, please subscribe to the ID24 channel for future events and, and streams and videos. We've got a lot planned and uh, the best way to find out about it is to subscribe to our channel. Um, we will be giving away another 90 day uh, JAWS license at the end of this hour. So please send your questions for the presenter uh, by tweeting it to the hashtag ID24 and we'll pass these on. Uh, we'll be asking these at the end of the presentation and every session we'll give a license away for the best question or the best tweet or the thing we find most fun or interesting. Um, note that the YouTube channel uh, channel chat is open, but we're not going to be monitoring that for questions, but feel free to chat to your fellow participants and share info there. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, Talison Smith, who's going to be talking on the subject of building accessibility and inclusive inclusion into interactive science simulations. Over to you, Talison. All right, thank you. I'm very excited to be here at Inclusive Design 24. Um, I've uh, uh, watched many of the videos and rewatched many of the videos, so I'm excited to take part. So thank you for the opportunity. So yeah, I'll be talking about uh, building accessibility and inclusion into interactive science simulations. So here we go. Um, in this talk, I will uh, introduce the FET Interactive Simulations Project, tell you about uh, the FET simulation, uh, about FET simulation design and their design philosophy, uh, share our accessibility challenge, and describe the infrastructure we have created um, to address um, the accessibility challenges. And then I'll uh, demonstrate um, the infrastructure in the simulation. Describe the infrastructure we have created um, to address um, the accessibility challenges. Uh, there's a bit of a delay here. Um, I think I'll, um, uh, I can hear the presentation, so I don't know if I should put my headphones in. Um, I'll go ahead and, and continue and see what's, uh, how it goes. So I will demonstrate the infrastructure so you can see how it works in the simulation. Uh, introductions, uh, you've already, I'm, I'm Talison. Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Talison Smith. And uh, I work at the FET Interactive Simulations Project. Uh, we have an accessibility page uh, at fet.colorado.edu um, slash en slash accessibility. Uh, the FET website is uh, FET.colorado.edu, and um, all of uh, FET's code is um, uh, open source and on GitHub. So you can, uh, if you're interested in more of the code, you can go on uh, GitHub and follow at FETSIMS. Uh, so I'm going to talk about science and uh, a little bit about science, more about simulations, but experimentation. Uh, is key to exploring science. And labs and demonstrations um, have sort of been the mainstay for uh, allowing students to explore science. In this, in this slide, there's a picture of a student and her teacher looking at a, a glass jar um, filled with, a blue, uh, with some blue liquid in it and examining it. And uh, there's another picture of a group of students um, exploring the physics of airflow with a uh, model uh, windmill. Uh, and these are great ways to learn. Uh, however, um, uh, labs and demonstrations are not accessible all the time uh, to all students, and they pose a range of access issues for students with disabilities. Interactive science simulations are more readily available, like they could be used on the fly. Uh, they help students learn and think about science. Uh, they do not require special equipment. Cre they create a safe lab-like exploratory experience. Uh, they allow students to experiment and discover science like a scientist when they're designed really well. And on this page is a picture of a, a teacher um, 
uh, and uh, a few students in a computer lab using FET simulations. There's a picture of uh, FET simulations being used in another country um, on a um, being projected on a board in a in a lecture demonstration. And there's um, two little boys uh, playing on an iPad uh, on a on a couch. Um, so they're all enjoying FET simulations in uh, different ways. The FET simulation, uh, the FET interactive simulation project was uh, uh, started to address um, accessible um, learning challenges uh, in, for science in general. It was started in 2002. Uh, the project has built 170 science and math simulations. About 50 of them have been converted into HTML5. Uh, they run um, 100 million times a year. Uh, um, that's what they tell me. And uh, they, they, the FET has built a translation tool allowing the sims to be translated, um, uh, crowdsourced. And, and then I'll uh, demonstrate um, uh, the infrastructure okay. in the simulation. Describe the infrastructure we have created um, to address um, the accessibility challenges. Uh, there's a bit of a delay here. Um, I think I'll... Um, I don't know what to do about that. I can hear the presentation, so I don't know if I should. I'm just putting on my headphones. Um, I'm just putting on my headphones because I'm getting some feedback. I'm not sure what I did wrong. I see. There, got it. Sorry, I had the browser open. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, so the, the the simulations have been translated into 87 languages. Uh, there's uh, they are flexible exploratory learning tools. Uh, they are used with a diverse range of students. They're free of uh, free of cost and openly licensed. And now I will introduce a um, a FET simulation called Balloons and Static Electricity, uh, and um, demonstrate some of the design features of a FET simulation. In general, a FET simulation is intuitive and easy uh, to use, highly interactive, providing real-time feedback, uh, and uh, has a fun and game-like uh, experience to it. And most of all, it's very flexible for teachers and students to learn with. Um, so here we go uh, on our first demonstration. So this uh, simulation um, is about static electricity. Uh, and the really cool things about this simulation are it has a sweater, a balloon, and a wall. The sweater's on the left, the balloon is in the middle, and the wall is on the right. Uh, all objects show their uh, positive and negative charges. They all have net neutral charge um, with equal numbers of um, positive and negative charges. The positive charges are red, rep, um, represented by red circles, and the negative charges are represented by um, blue circles. Um, plus and minus signs are on there too. Um, so, um, what you can do with this simulation is, um, well, you can, uh, grab the balloon and, um, move it around and explore what happens when you rub it on the wall. Nothing really happens. So, um, you may, um, explore a little bit further and rub on the sweater and you see that you start to accumulate negative charges and, um, and then uh, you may accidentally or intentionally release the balloon and see that uh, the balloon is attracted to the sweater that now is positively charged and the balloon is negatively charged. You might explore further with the wall to see if there's some changes now. And you see that there's some repulsion of negative charges in the wall. And so a student doing this exploration could learn about induced charge you, um, a teacher could demonstrate the simulation in different views. So they could ask for predictive, um, they could turn off the charge view and show no charges and ask students to predict what will happen when the, 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 the balloon is released. And if you release it close to the wall, it sticks there. If you lose it a little farther away, it retracts over to the sweater. You can also explore concepts of net charge um, uh, by showing the show charge differences view. Um, but what's really important about simulation design here is that there's very little text. Um, the, you don't need any instructions. 
uh, I'm just turning back the sh uh, turn back uh, show all charges view. Uh, so the Fed simulation philosophy is that the design of the sim should implicitly guide the student in their exploration. Um, so uh, they wouldn't need instructions on how to use it and they can learn to use it very quickly. So they very quickly start to think about the science and why these things are happening. Um, and uh, they you know, can either do things like remove the wall and see what happens. And you can also play with two balloons and, and start to explore more deeply about the concepts of repulsion and um, you know why does the why does the yellow balloon um, go over to the side when um, when there's two balloons in there? So um, that's a FET simulation um, in a nutshell. And uh, I'll go back to my my presentation. The most important thing is this concept of implicit scaffolding. So the design of the sim implicitly scaffolds the student and puts them on productive paths of learning. And that's a, a big feature of FET simulations. So uh, they're also very flexible, as I said, and this is very useful in the classroom because activities can be quite diverse um, and, and, and used in different contexts, like for lecture or for homework or for whatever. And also abilities of students are quite diverse. So inclusive um, education creates integrated classrooms and um, so students are now learning together in very uh, diverse environments. 98% of students with disabilities are integrated into general education schools, and 40% of their time is spent in general education classrooms. So it's really important to make all learning tools accessible to as many students, if not all students, as possible. So the big um, FETS accessibility challenge is uh, everything is rendered uh, graphically with scenery, a custom scene graph for HTML5. Uh, scenery makes interactive graphics using Canvas, SVG, and WebGL, exposing no useful information within the DOM for accessibility. Scenery's graphics provide no semantic structure, no keyboard operation, and no alternatives, uh, no text alternatives. So this is obviously uh, a big problem. Um, so when a student comes to a um, simulation with assistive technology, such as a screen reader, they'll just have a sea of black boxes. And on the screen here, I have a picture of the simulation and then uh, little uh, call out boxes in black pointing to um, the fun interactive ob objects that we just explored um, in, the, in the visual demonstration. So there's a black box pointing to the sim and the, the students will hear the page title uh, balloons and static electricity, but then they might go, oh, uh, what is, what's in here? How do, I, how do I get started? And they won't be able to get any information. Um, and so the, the fun, cool balloon is, um, provides no information. The sweater ha has no information. The wall has no information. The interactive objects um, or the interactive controls at the bottom that change conditions in the room um, have no labels and um, state information. So uh, um, FETS accessibility initiative um, is rethinking accessibility, is rethink, rethinking the accessibility of a FET simulation and rethinking the architecture that creates FET simulations. And uh, to do so, they, we take the, um, we look at the simulation through the lens of inclusive design. And uh, Estelle just uh, covered this in her talk, but um, uh, so it's defined in, through inclusive design uh, accessibility is defined uh, as a mismatch between the user and the user interface. So a user plus a black box equals a disability. Uh, access an uh, accessible simulation, accessible simulation architecture um, is the ability of the system's architecture to build simulations that meet or flex to the needs of the user. So um, we want to make our sim the um, more flexible to meet the needs of um, more students. So inclusive uh, system architecture. Uh, the system goal would be uh, to build a sim that enables a blind student to use uh, the keyboard uh, to grab and move the balloon or any other input device of their choice uh, to explore where and how charges are accumulated so they can uh, learn about the concepts of static electricity and to collaborate with their classmates, classmates using the same sim like in a group activity or in a classroom activity 
But we also have some pretty serious design constraints. Um, the simulation still has to run natively in a browser. Uh, the interface that has to interface easily with assistive technology, such as screen reader software, and offer flexibility for pedagogical design and use like the visual simulations do. So some tra traditional approaches um, uh, for accessibility, um, as the, described in the, some of the, the talks before mine, are um, create really great HTML, um, which will provide all the accessibility information needed to the parallel DOM, or to the DOM, to document object model. The document object, object model sends that information to the accessibility API, and the S accessibility API uh, builds the accessibility tree, which is accessed by assistive technology, and then um, uh, the information uh, is presented in an accessible way to the user. So I have a, um, a little uh, flow chart there describing those steps. So that's how a, a typical web page would be made accessible. You provide really good HTML, um, as described by Estelle in the previous talk, and uh, you're uh, well on your way of making a very accessible experience. However, the Sims currently, as I said, were built in, are built in Canvas, SVG, and WebGL. So they provide no information to the DOM, no accessibility information to the DOM. So we have um, no information to pass along the um, to the accessibility API or to the accessibility tree. Now you could uh, potentially um, provide. Uh, um, Bet had actually did try to um, create a subtree for Canvas. Um, but uh, that didn't work for WebGL. And they also tried uh, just providing accessibility information in SVG and Canvas in other ways. And um, uh, there was a problem for that. I can't, sorry, and there was a problem for that. Uh, the, the, both those solutions were um, uh, problematic because WebGL didn't work with the subtree and the Canvas subtree. And if you, uh, provide direct information, uh, accessibility information into SVG and Canvas or WebGL. The information ends up in multiple places in the simulation, creating it uh, very uh, difficult to manage and maintain. So FET's approach um, to this problem was to generate a parallel structure um, that matches all visual elements in the scene graph uh, in the visual sim with HTML elements um, in a parallel document object model. And so the approach is um, you have Canvas and SVG, and then you have a mirrored uh, HTML structure, uh, and that gives all the accessibility information to the DOM, which can create an, um, all the accessibility information uh, to the uh, accessible API and to accessibility tree. And then the SIM can be used by a more diverse group of students. So this, oh sorry, this is called a, par we call this the parallel document object model um, because we haven't, um, there's two things now. There's the, the, every, all the visual information and then there's the generated um, uh, structure of HTML and they're both um, part of the DOM. So they both provide information to the DOM. So our DOM has quite a bit of power um, we have uh, discovered and um, it has, it's built on, you know, technologies that have technical power. Um, but it's also provided a lot of pedagogical power um, in many ways. And so I'm going to talk about that now. So the technical power, of course, comes from uh, HTML. Uh, it provides familiar semantic structure. Uh, it provides elements that are easy, easy to make keyboard accessible. So easy keyboard accessibility for native HTML form elements. And it also creates a customizable repository for naming and describing some objects. Uh, with um, semantic information like headings and paragraphs and other structures. And uh, with ARIA support, uh, the really important thing about ARIA is that it allows us to um, uh, create special semantics for custom interactive objects uh, like the balloon, um, which is, doesn't really map to anything that's, um, that HTML can, uh, it doesn't really map to an HTML element like a slider or something, because you can move it all over the place. And then it also, um, we can provide a whole, um, uh, we can just provide descriptions during interaction with ARIA live regions. So these, these two 
are the these two technologies, HTML um, and ARIA, are the main uh, technologies behind the parallel DOM. So to it just sort of demonstrate that uh, on this on this slide, we've got a little picture of the simulation, and on the right side is a sort of simplified version of the parallel DOM. And so now you can see the um, which has this all the features of the visual, um, all the main elements of the visual sim. So you have an H1, it's called it's balloon, balloons and static electricity. You have an H2, um, uh, uh, you have a number of H2 headings that uh, define the sections, uh, regions of the simulation. And you have uh, uh, H3 headings that describe the main objects in the simulation. And then you have interactive controls. And so on the sim, on the screen right now, all the headings are, um, diamonds and you can navigate by heading if you want or and all the uh, interactive controls like the button to grab the balloon or to remove the wall are in circles and they're numbered uh, in their uh, in the tab order now this is a little hard to explain here so I just wanted to show um, because there's a lot more than these just these labels um, there's a lot more to the simulation than just a sweater uh, a yellow balloon and a wall, and uh, and these labels for the UI controls. So I'm going to demonstrate the um, accessibility view that we created, um, and we create this as a design tool. Uh, interactive sim in a frame on the left, and on the right, you can see all of the description content that describes the simulation um, in its native HTML structure. Um, and then up in this orange box at the top, uh, at the top of that structure are the alerts that will fire uh, once you start uh, using the simulation. So in this demonstration here, I just want to show you the keyboard accessibility. And so now when I go into the simulation, if I'm a visual keyboard user, I can, uh, my, my, I have a keyboard focus on the balloon and I can grab it by using the space or enter key and then I get a little bit of uh, some hints um, on how to move it because that might not be obvious if I'm not hearing the descriptions. And uh, so I can either use the arrow keys or the WASD keys and start exploring with the keyboard. And as you see in the alert box on the right, um, you'll find out where you, uh, it tells you where the balloon is. So it's now on the left side of the play area and uh, now it's on the sweater and you'll get another alert um, as soon as it starts picking up um, charges from the sweater. So it says yellow balloon picks up um, negative charges from sweater. Yellow balloon picks up more negative charges. And I can keep exploring. Um, if I took go right, there's another update. Um, I'm not picking up charges, but then the sim tells me where, uh, the alert tells me where those charges are going. Um, I can release the balloon with the spacebar enter key. I can tab to the other interactive objects and add a balloon, um, or I can go through the um, radio buttons with the arrow keys as Estelle described in her talk, um, and I can get keyboard help if I need it, um, which is quite useful. And because I also, in the simulation, there are some custom um, keyboard um, things that we thought would be relatively, um, would be pedagogically relevant, so I can, uh, jump to the center of the play area, or I can jump the wall. I can jump near the sweater. <clears throat> All of these things are um, uh, more obvious in the non-visual environment, but uh, even if using a keyboard, you can um, kind of figure out what's going on. So the two things here, the keyboard accessibility and the alerts, is what I want to show you in that demonstration. And um, so the pedagogical power um, the pedagogical power uh, is also quite impressive because uh, this, this whole system provides a robust platform for non-visual implicit scaffolds. So uh, like in the design of the visual simulation, there's, very mi there's minimal text, um, there's this big bright yellow balloon uh, in the middle of the play area, and students generally in the visual simulation figure out within seconds that the most productive thing to do is to grab that balloon and start uh, rubbing it against the wall of the sweater to figure out what's going to happen. Um, but in the non-visual environment, we actually need a lot of text. 
Um, but then there's a lot of things that you can do with that text um, um, if you make that text um, semantically rich. So for example, a student with a, using a screen reader can um, do a very high level exploration of the simulation by heading. Um, so they'll get a uh, yellow balloon, or they'll get balloons instead of electricity, scene summary, play area, and in the play area there are three subheadings, um, the sweater, the yellow balloon, and the wall, uh, and then another H2 level heading, uh, the control panel, and some other UI things that I just cut off, but you know, the rest of the control panel items, like the balloon settings, uh, the charge settings, and the, um, yeah, oh yeah, those are the headings, sorry. Uh, they can do an interactive exploration, so if they may not explore by heading, they might just tab through the simulation or use their screen reader controls to find out if there are any interactive items. Um, there are a number of commands that come with screen readers um, that just allow users to explore the page content in many different ways. So you can tab, the first tab in the, the simulation is to the grab yellow balloon button, um, uh, then the remove wall button, and then two balloon experiment checkbox, um, reset balloon button, uh, oh, the charge radios, and, the re and then the re reset balloon button, and the reset all button. And then you can also tab further to get the keyboard help uh, or information about the FET project, um, the, the FET menu. Um, those aren't included here in this, um, in this diagram. Uh, and then also, um, you can do a deep exploration line by line of the simulation if you like. And what we found in interviews is that um, blind users usually do the deep exploration first, and it takes about a minute to read through all the content um, in the simulation. But as soon as they've read through all that content, they've, they've, uh, uh, they, they figure out that, like, it's like when a, um, they figure out that the balloon is the most important object. And if it, and uh, so anyway, the, um, any way the student decides to uh, explore the simulation, they'll find productive paths to, um, to interaction. And so we're finding that this HTML structure provides that, those productive pathways um, in many different ways that are useful for non-visual um, uh, exploration. And the content, the content in the simulation um, also hints at um, productive paths when, they're, um, when they may not be obvious. So in early, inter, in early interviews, the balloon um, was a little more complicated uh, than uh, the grab yellow balloon button because it's a custom element, which I'll talk about a little later. Uh, so we put in a hint that said, look for grab button to play uh, to get st students on the right path. And there's, those might be good for other simulations with more complex interactions. So now, uh, with this arch architecture in place, um, with this architecture in place, we have uh, the simulation. We have the same picture of the simulation with uh, some uh, call-out boxes. And instead of getting a whole bunch of black boxes, uh, we now get information about the simulation. We get the title. Uh, we get a description of the scene. The play area is a small room. Uh, currently, it has a yellow balloon, a sweater, and a removable wall. They read on further, they're gonna get a description of the sweater, has a few more negative, um, well, if it's just starting, it'll have the, um, no more uh, positive charges than negative charges, but in this in this screenshot, the, the interaction has already started. Um, so the, the sweater has a few more positive charges than negative charges. The balloon uh, is on the sweater, it's picking up negative charges. Uh, the wall um, has many pairs of negative and positive charges, it has net. Um, zero charge. Uh, so you, you get all this information about charges and then you also get all the um, uh, labels uh, and state information on the UI controls like on the radio buttons, the checkbox, uh, and the checkbox. Uh, so now I'm going to demonstrate the simulation with a screen reader. So I'm going to turn on, I'm going to unplug my headphones and um, Turn on voiceover. Oh, I'm going to open up my sim first and turn on voiceover. 
voiceover or safari balloons and static electricity window balloons and static electricity has keyboard focus and then i'm going to explore the simulation in a similar way as i did before but now with the keyboard and with voiceover on grab yellow balloon yellow balloon group grab at center of play area has no more negative charges than positive charges press w a s or d key to move balloon space key to release left closer to sweater on left side of play area on left side of play area near sweater on sweater yellow balloon picks up negative charges from yellow balloon picks up more negative charges yellow balloon picks up more negative charges right no change in charges on right arm of sweater no change in charges on right arm of sweater more pairs of charges up and to the left no change in off sweater closer to center of play area at center of play area at center of play area closer to wall side of play area near wall at wall no transfer of charge negative charges and wall move away from yellow balloon a little bit positive chart up at wall no transfer of charge negative charges and wall move away from yellow balloon a lot positive charges do not move down at wall no tramp at wall no tramp at wall no transfer of charge negative charges and wall move away from yellow balloon a little bit positive chart left very close to near wall grab yellow balloon really moves quickly yellow balloon at wall yellow balloon group grab left very close to near wall closer to center of play area grab yellow balloon moves very slowly left yellow balloon sticking to right arm of sweater remove wall wall removed from play area two balloon experiments unchecked check two balloon experiments checkbox green balloon added to play area remove wall grab green balloon green balloon group grab on left side of play area has no more net left on left side of play area Near sweater on sweater, no change in charges. Green balloon, green balloon picks up green balloon, green balloon at green balloon has several more negative charges up. Green balloon at green balloon has several more negative charges than positive charges. Sweater has many more positive charges than negative charges. At center of play area, grab green balloon, moves green balloon, sticking to right shoulder of sweater. Remove wall. Okay, so so in that um in that demonstration, uh, I wasn't describing what was going on because I was hoping you'd get most of it from the screen reader. So I had a pretty deep exploration of getting charges on the yellow balloon, uh, releasing it, and then adding a green balloon to the play area and getting some more charges on that and also doing a release with that and it attracted um, to the sweater as well. Um, I could also set up a balloon race. I don't Remove think wall. this will... Grab green balloon. So I'll jump the green balloon over to the wall. Green balloon, group, at upper wall. Grab green balloon, grab yellow balloon. No change in position. Yellow balloon, group, grab. On right arm at wall. Negative charges and wall move away from yellow balloon a lot. All right, so they got two. The two balloons are against the wall. Grab and then green I'm balloon. Going to remove wall. No change in position. Wall. Yellow Let's balloon and wall. Wall removed. Moves quickly. Moves quickly. Green balloon sticking to right shoulder of sweater. Still moving up. Yellow balloon sticking to lower left side of sweater. And uh, so you don't get everything, but you get. Um, uh, we're still working on the two balloon uh, experiment descriptions. Um, so that's um, it for that demonstration. Audi 24 presentation, building accessibility and inclusion into interactive science simulations. Oh, I have to turn off voiceover, sorry. Voiceover off. <laughs> so helpful. Uh, so um, so that's uh, um, the sea of information that I wanted to talk about. And um, and then I just wanted to sort of summarize a bit more about the technical, the technical implementation. So the uh, parallel document object model um, that uh, uh, we've created is compatible with Canvas, SVG, and WebGL. It minimizes complex, uh, complexity with, uh, uh, with a simplified structure, contains all the accessibility information and descriptions in one place. It represents visual elements with native HTML elements familiar to users. It harnesses existing accessibility support by browsers and assistive technologies, uh, HTML5 and ARIA in particular. And it embraces, uh, I didn't talk about the web content accessibility guidelines, but it embraces uh, the, the WCAG um, principles, creating a robust and flexible uh, accessibility layer, which allows designers like me to um, use my knowledge of HTML and uh, describe the sim uh, in a way that I think uh, will be useful for um, uh, non-visual users. So, um, and I also um, put in a quick quote from Aaron uh, Gustafson in his uh, talk. Uh, HTML is often overlooked and undervalued, um, but we have really, um, we are really pushing the limits of HTML5 here and with ARIA. And um, we're um, excited about this work. And, um, 
and uh, I think we are really pushing, I mean, using HTML as, as much as it can be used and um, then trying to figure out how to, how to describe sim elements when HTML is not going to do it for us. So, um, uh, Aaron, we're really taking the value of HTML to its limits. <laughs> um, so we have continued challenges, of course, uh, in our design um, process. Uh, keyboard users, uh, inter um, uh, interactive sim objects uh, that don't look like HTML controls can be confusing because uh, the for example, the two balloon um, experiment checkbox. Uh, we're not sure if that should be a checkbox or two radio buttons. Uh, I like the checkbox because it's less verbose in the non-visual environment, um, but it might be more intuitive um, for visual users if it's uh, two radio buttons. Um, but it doesn't look like either, so it may be confusing for visual keyboard users. Uh, the standard HTML is limited for complex interactive objects. So, for example, the balloon, um, there's nothing in HTML that, uh, there's no form elements in HTML that move freely in four directions. Uh, so um, we had to use ARIA to um, create that experience. Um, but um, custom SIM objects are difficult to, exp um, to make clear to users. Uh, so custom SIM objects like the balloon need um, explicit instructions on how to use them. Uh, although there are some intuitive ways to make them accessible, like we can use the arrow keys uh, to move the balloon, uh, but some screen readers uh, don't allow um, access to the arrow, arrow keys, which is why we provided the alternative um, uh, WASD keys. So when you grab the yellow balloon, it launches a custom uh, application role, and then you can, and that balloon becomes a movable object. And so we had to describe to the users how to use that, and it, it's not a, it's not a small description, which makes the a little less interactive than the the visual environment, but uh, understandable and usable um, for screen reader users. Complex elements have complex keyboard design patterns. So as we get um, into more advanced interactions, we're curious to know if um, um, students, younger students in particular, will be able to use these more complex keyboard design patterns. Like, for example, a list box could be used a list box to represent the different layers of an atom, um, where you're you know, building an atom with uh, uh, moving particles around in an atom, for example. Um, can we make that um, clear to users? AT um, and browsers uh, have fixed combinations, and there are inconsistencies across these combinations that um, are frustrating uh, for us as designers. And uh, so we, um, I would love, there's a shout out here for some help, uh, avoiding some repetition by screen readers. Is there, are there some things that we're missing? Because uh, when I read through the radio buttons, I hear the labels twice. Um, and I'm just wondering if I'm doing something wrong or if uh, um, that's just the way um, it is when you make an accessible uh, radio button. And uh, um, also uh, tips on using live regions. Uh, we're using multiple live regions and um, uh, we've built our own custom um, alert queue uh, to help us deliver the alerts in a timely fashion, but still screen readers, uh, voiceover in particular kind of interrupts itself, so some information gets lost. Uh, big takeaway so far with uh, uh, what we've seen from users is that uh, screen reader users explore and engage with the sim. Uh, students familiar with keyboard commands easily use the sim with a keyboard, and keyboard presses are easily learned by users less familiar with using keyboard with a keyboard. So if they're given a little bit of instruction, um, they can use the sim with the keyboard. Uh, there's lots of other takeaways, um, but I was just uh, focusing a, a little bit on that. But the, the main thing is that uh, screen reader users really explore and engage with the sim. Um, you know, if I sh should have included some quotes from users here. Um, for example, uh, one user said, I'm just going to remove all the charges on the sweater because I can. And, um, and he could do that uh, based on the descriptions he was hearing. And that was interesting because uh, visual users do that uh, in interviews. And uh, so it was very exciting for me to see him um, do, the, do the same thing. And they, uh, another user said, um, 
oh, uh, um, oh well, they, sorry, I made a prediction and said, um, I, the, I made a prediction saying the balloon is going to now move uh, to, the sweater, uh, to the sweater and it went to the wall. And she was like, oh, why did that happen? And um, so then she had to explore more deeply and uh, uh, things like that happen. And so they're learning, they're engaging with the science, which is really exciting. <clears throat> so broader bitter beneficial impact. Um, some of the uh, things are, uh, this is a, even though we've designed for screen reader users so, so far, uh, we are thinking about more users as we design. Um, and uh, the immediate benefits for designing for, uh, the immediate broader impact is that when you design for screen reader access, you also um, make it accessible for anyone who uses the keyboard or um, uh, more keyboard-like uh, input devices like uh, a switch. Um, the descriptions we have designed may benefit students with cognitive disabilities um, who would like to hear content read aloud to them. Uh, and designers and developers of interactives may find um, this approach useful and maybe consider using it. Uh, there's probably a, a lot more going on um, that I could say, but uh, those are some of the broader impacts of uh, taking an inclusive design approach. And uh, a concluding message that I have uh, would be that uh, action, uh, there's, um, action and agency begin with imagination. And in science, this um, sort of equals experimentation. So providing uh, that ability to uh, take action, um, well, creating access that allows the students to take action uh, creates a sense of agency, which allows them to learn more deeply. And um, another quote, um, which I can't remember where I got it from, but um, I think it was from a blind scientist, so I will add uh, the references here. Uh, students do best when they are able to study what interests them. And so getting them interested in science, we think is really important um, if they find that interesting. Um, if the content's not accessible, they can't even explore it to find if, the, if it, it is accessible, uh, if it is interesting. <clears throat> this is also an ongoing design project. It's new work. And we're um, uh, trying uh, uh, several different things. So alternative input, uh, auditory description, and uh, sonification. So if you want to find out more, you can go to fet.colorado.edu slash en slash accessibility. Uh, uh, some of the sims uh, that are available, uh, well, all the HTML5 sims, I got links here for the HTML5 sims. John Travoltage is a simple sim, our uh, first published accessible sim. Um, it's available on the FET website. And then uh, the ex I have a couple of links to uh, accessible prototypes on this side, uh, the, the demonstrations that I um, made with balloons and static electricity, the alley view and the main sim. And there's also uh, another sim, um, Ohm's Law, the Ohm's Law simulation, which, uh, which has uh, discusses Ohm's Law. Uh, uh, is available. It's pretty um, advanced, um, it, almost ready to publish as well. So um, uh, we can explore that further. If there's time, I can demo it, but I don't think there's time. I want to give a big shout out to the FET team, uh, the accessibility team at, at FET. Uh, Jesse Greenberg, Michael Kausman, and Michael Barlow uh, are um, FET uh, accessibility developers, software developers that work on accessibility. And Jesse Greenberg in particular, I think he worked really hard on the Parallel DOM, but he's um, been implementing uh, everything for balloons and static electricity. So big shout out to Jesse. Um, I also wanna um, give a shout out to our collaborators at the Inclusive Design Research Center in Toronto, Canada. Um, John Hung, Justin Obera did the design work for uh, John Travoltage, um, the first, uh, the accessible, the accessibility features for John Travoltage and uh, Karen Watkins at the IRC as well. Um, we've all been working together for the last while um, trying to work out these uh, issues. And then there's uh, some, on this slide, there's resources and funders. So I have to say that this uh, project was funded by the National Science Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, and the University of Colorado. Um, you can find more resources at fet.colorado.edu. Um, and the accessibility, there's a link here to the FET accessibility research page. Um, this slide deck will be available at bit, 
2017 id24 it's not available there yet but it will be and um, if you have want to contact me i'm talison.smith at colorado.edu um, i'd love questions about research and usability um, and uh, get involved if you like and follow FET at, on, at, at FET Sims at Twitter, at FET Sims on GitHub, and at FET, um, FET Sims on, on Facebook. That's it. Hello, Tillerson. Yes. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for that great presentation. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't turn off. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm speaking the video. to you twice. Yeah, that was great. Uh, yeah. we, we both loved that demo as well. Just to, it, it was really smooth, and just seeing the keyboard behavior and the output for screen reader users was fantastic. Okay, thanks. Are there any questions? Uh, so let's just do a last check of Twitter. Uh, no questions for you, but we do have uh, a winner for our 90 day skills license. Over to you, Henny. So uh, just a quick reminder for each session, we pick the best question tweeted to the hashtag um, ID24. Best question, best comment. Um, and our winner for this session is Andrea Skeris, and we'll be contacting you directly in a moment. Excellent. So a uh, reminder to, uh, to tweet and ask questions for, for all of these sessions, and you could be in a chance to, to win a JAWS license. Um, and also, I'd uh, like to remind you that ID24 is brought to you by the Paciello Group with kind support from Barclays and the Center for Inclus Inclusive Design. And we couldn't be doing this without them. You can find out more about those uh, organizations on our website. Uh, oh, sorry. So. Once again, tell us, thank you so much for presenting. That was that was really, really interesting. As Henny said, I loved the the demo. That was it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, everyone, take a take a look at the, the work uh, Tellison's been doing, and uh, I hope you find it as interesting as we did. Okay, uh, we will be back at the top of the hour. Do we um, have? Do I have time to ask you guys a couple of questions? Yes, of course. Yes, if you have okay. a question. We still have some time, right? Yeah, we have a few minutes. Okay, so I wanted to, um, I'm just going to slide back to the um, challenges that uh, we're still having. And um, so uh, I was wondering, um, as uh, experts in accessibility, if you have any experience on using like multiple live regions with uh, lots of content um, and using them a lot, um, or uh, tips on uh, uh, repetition of, uh, label information on uh, form controls. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, on the spot. <laughs> so um, oh, we're again, I, I think in general, uh, I'd usually recommend not having multiple live regions and, and just having maybe uh, uh, maybe one and, and sort of restricting it to, to small amounts of information. But I think you have a special case here. Yes. And, uh, so that um, that advice may not apply. Uh, one thing I was interested in is is how you ran your testing, and you know testing with with your real users is what matters most, not not the opinion of of you know an accessibility specialist. I, I'd say um, that's true. So. Like, I mean, it's working, but um, we're just trying to optimize and. Um, uh, so we have we do consult regularly with screen reader users, and uh, um, we have it's it's hard to find um, students uh, uh, in the uh, to test the simulations, but we have managed to find a few um, and set up collaborations to get access to students with uh, vision impairments, um, and done some other usability tests with students, but. Uh, um, definitely um, talking to screen reader consultants throughout the design process and t testing regularly, um, trying to do a very quick, as quick as possible iteration so we can get it in front of users um, faster and faster, like as we um, improve the design and the descriptions. That's what we've been trying to do. Sounds good. So I'm going to agile approach to, to working on it. Yeah. Iterative. Yeah. 
Okay, I think that wraps up the, this session. Uh, it's all we've got time for. So like I said, we'll see you at the top of the hour for our next presentation. Thanks all right. Once again, Alison. Thanks, Alison. Okay, bye. Bye.